why did you decide to make a podcast about Monero? What was it about Monero that you know really tickled your fancy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, like like so many others, I believe I started off as a, a Bitcoin maxi. Um, right. Actually, yeah, I'll, I'll go back and tell tell the whole story. So, first crypto I ever bought. Guess guess what it was? Guess can everybody guess? Litecoin. Dogecoin. Okay. Dogecoin in, in twenty uh, in twenty thirteen, Christmas Eve twenty thirteen, I bought fifty dollars worth of Dogecoin from on Reddit. I sent somebody a PayPal transaction. These are like all the things you like you like really shouldn't do. Like there was like, no that. trust involved. The guy could have just ran away with the fifty bucks. I was like whatever. Right. I had I had watched Bitcoin. You know, read about it, but never understood. Never stopped to understand the tech. I just thought it was a, an attempt at digital cash. I thought, assumed it was centralized. I didn't know there was this great breakthrough in technology where they figured out how to make these truly decentralized tech. Um, and so I saw a Doge. I was like, oh, let me throw fifty bucks at it, turn it into whatever five thousand dollars. It's maybe it's you know the next the next scamorama after Bitcoin. <laughs> not understanding Bitcoin. I bought my fifty dollars with Doge, and I woke up the next day on on Christmas morning. And uh, I went to check my my Doge wallet. I was all happy and giddy, and it was all gone. Everything was oh, gone. No. There, there, was, there was a big hack. Everybody's online. Another no no, right? Like you don't you don't store not your not your keys, not your coins. I was storing my Doge coin on a online wallet that somebody had made, and then probably the person who ran the thing hacked it right and stole everybody's Doge. Yep. Um, and I was like, this is this is crazy. I'm like, this is how crypto works. I'm like, this does not <laughs> seem like a good invention. I mean, everybody's just going to get hacked and they're going to lose all their money. So that actually ended up being the best fifty I ever lost in crypto. Although, if I would have had the Doge, I don't want to know how much it's worth today. Oh, <laughs> if yeah. it was worth the Doge then, it probably would have been millions now. Um, and so, but it led me down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, right? Because I was like, all right, hold on a second, I got to read about this. And I read the white paper, all that jazz, Andreas Antonopoulos videos. I was like, holy shit, this thing's decentralized. It's unstoppable. It's digital cash. I had always. Not always, but you know, in uh, I, I, you know, I, I came up in the '90s. I was an internet guy from the, kind of from the beginning, interested in technology. I was always interested in this concept of digital cash, right? Something that people can use on the internet that would be like cash before the internet. I thought of roundabout ways in my head and how it could potentially be done, but never thought you know that anybody would figure it out. And sure enough, with Bitcoin, it seemed like they did. Uh, so I got very much into Bitcoin for those reasons, for the digital cash purposes. But it wasn't until I actually started using Bitcoin mm -hmm. that I realized it's not really like it's not really digital cash. When when I use cash in the real world, I spend it, and nobody knows I spent it. And right. I, I like that aspect of cash. And I thought that's what Bitcoin was. But when I started like sending it to my friends, and I even I made some transactions online just for fun, you know, I was like, I didn't want to spend my Bitcoin, but I was like, let me see how this stuff works. And then I'd go ch go on the on the Block Explorer to make sure my transactions went through. And as I'm looking at it, I'm like, well, if I could see this, everybody else could see this, you know. Right. And my best friend, who I just sent fifty bucks, who's now texting me back, be like, oh. Thanks, and I, I see you have X amount of Bitcoin in your in your wallet. I'm like that, that's cool and all, but you know, it's typically when I pay somebody uh, in the meat space with cash, and they they then don't know how much money I have in my bank account. So that led me then down the Monero rabbit hole. Monero was just kind of being talked about at that time in 2014, right? And I just kept kept an eye on it, and I listened to. Other BTC maxis that I respected. Uh, Peter Todd was one of the first persons I heard talking about it in the early days as this new crypto that was different than Bitcoin, sim very similar in tech, blockchain, proof of work, all that stuff, except it was the ledger. The ledger itself was encrypted. So you couldn't see who was sending what to who and how much. And that really piqued my interest because I was like, wait a minute. So this, this now solves that problem. Uh, no longer is it this traceable or surveillance tech. It's now actually truly digital cash. And that's how I got into Monero. And I started the Monero Talk podcast many years ago. Uh, through my interests, I wanted to speak to the people that were working on the Monero project. And I wanted to speak to all these BTC maxis that I really respected at the time and to find out why 
perhaps they weren't more into Monero. So I really started it just for my own exploration purposes. I figured it would give me access to people that I wanted to talk to. And it, it, it worked out, certainly worked out uh, for, for those purposes. You just watched a clip from episode 68 of The Next Block. If you enjoyed that clip, hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, share it with a friend, and let us know down in the comments below what your favorite part was and what you think of Monero and privacy cryptocurrencies. If you enjoyed the clip and want to catch the entire interview, check out the video description down below for a link to the entire episode. To support the podcast even further, check out the video description down below for a link to our Algorand donation wallet. This wallet accepts most Algorand standard assets and is a great way to support the podcast. The next handful of weeks on our live show have a bunch of great guests, including Tony Edward from Thinking Crypto, Stacey Warden, the CEO of the Algorand Foundation, Anthony Scaramucci of Skybridge Capital, and so many more guests. So be sure to subscribe, ping that notification bell, and we will catch you in the next episode. Thanks.